Renee and I were talking just the other day, and we said, we were just kind of, I was uh, overwhelmed with gratitude that God has allowed Renee and I to live our lives being part of this wonderful family called Mount Hope Church. And we were just thinking about, God, isn't this so amazing? Out of any place we could have landed in life, you saw fit to let us and continue to, to let us be part of this great family. And as Renee and I were thinking about that, and I'm thanking God, I couldn't help but think about, uh, I don't know why, I don't know why the Lord did this other than the fact that he loves me so much. But God saw fit to put a, a man in my life, his name is Dave Williams, Pastor Dave Williams, that God saw fit to put him in my life. And, and, it, and I don't know why, but he took a liking to me. I don't think I was that likable, but he liked me. And he would, he'd invite me to his house, and I would listen to him pray. And when I listen to him to pray, it's like I'm learning this is, how, this is what you can ask God for. And this is what you can expect when you pray. And, and I, would, I would listen to him, and I would watch him preach. And I, in the process, I'm learning, oh, this is how you take God's word and you deliver this to the people. I, I watched him love and care for people, lead, and be faithful for over 30 years as the pastor of Mount Hope Church. Like when others would come and go, he was there. And in, in doing so, he was teaching me what it means to be faithful, to stick with what God called you to do. Would you, I, hey, I couldn't think of anybody better to have in the pulpit other than Pastor Dave Williams. Would you give him a warm Mount Hope Church welcome? I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to that. I love you, man. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Kev. Thank you so much, Mount Hope family. It's great to be back here, and I thank God that Pastor Kev invited me to participate in this Roman series. Do you know, never once did Pastor Kev do what I did. I asked the previous pastor, begged him to come back and take the church back. Even at my 20th ministry anniversary, he came and spoke, and I said, do you want the church back again? <laughs> I'll tell you, there's no greater blessing uh, than to know that God had Pastor Kevin all ready to take this church when Pastor Dave retired from pastoring. <laughs> Pastor Kev, you have never disappointed me. You never did, and all, your, all, all the time I've known you since you were about 14 or 13 years old, when you, back when you had a mustache. <laughs> and I thank God for you, Pastor Kevin, because there is nobody better than God's chosen pastor for this church, and that, that is you. And I was reading in Exodus 4 this morning, and yesterday I read it also, and I reread it again today, because it talked about the staff in Moses' hand and the supernatural power it had. I mean, he'd raise his staff over the Red Sea, it would part. He'd throw his staff to the ground, it would turn into a snake. Pick it up, it'd turn back into a staff. And I thought about the staff Pastor Kev has surrounded himself with here. Exodus 4 says it's the staff of God. And man, that team Pastor Kev has raised up here and brought here is an amazing team. They're your staff, your supernatural staff, Pastor Kev. Well, God bless you, everybody. I'm, I'm so grateful to be here. Pastor Kevin has given me an assignment today to speak on Romans 12, 11 through 13, and he has been talking about never giving up on prayer, and don't quit praying, and persistence is an important matter, but my matter gets to a verse that's hard for pastors to talk about, so he invited me to talk about it. Will you stand and hold up your Bibles or hold up your cell phone, hold up your, your iDevice or your e-device or your digital device. And if you have nothing to hold up, 
just hold up something. Because I want you to say this, I believe the Bible. It is God's Word, inspired by the Holy Spirit. I believe the book. It shows me the way to heaven through faith in Jesus Christ alone. The book is filled with treasures, promises and assets that belong to me by faith. Today faith will come. My faith will grow. And I will release my faith for miracles in my life. I declare the devil bound, unable to pluck up the seed that's planted in my heart this day. God, open the eyes of my understanding. Give me ears to hear what your spirit is saying. Give me a heart to respond. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. My assignment is Romans 12, verse 13, but before we get to 13, we need a little review from verse 11 because it really is all connected. Here's what Paul said, never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Now, I feel like I'm singing to the choir today. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble. And keep on praying. Pastor Kev has driven that into us the last two weeks. But here's verse 13. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always eager to practice hospitality, which if you look up means warm generosity. In other words, he's saying be creative or be inventive in finding ways of being warmly generous. Now, how can we help God's people that are in need? How can we practice being warmly generous when Pastor Kev has a project or something that needs money? How can we be warmly generous if we're broke? How can we help others in need if we're the ones that are always broke? I've found that when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, in time, we will be transformed into generous givers. I've found that people who really came to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, the one who died on the cross for your sin and mine, the one who rose from the dead, ascended to heaven and said, I'm coming again, that same Jesus. When we receive him into our lives through what we call salvation, do you know what happens? We quit asking, how much do I have to give? And we start saying, how can I get into a position where I can be more warmly generous, as Paul said in verse 13? People are always saying, I wish I had more money. I wish the bills were paid. Then I could help the church and I could help others. Well, I'm going to speak to you today from my heart about this warm generosity. And actually, I'm going to talk to you about the very first switch that needs to be flipped in a believer's life to activate what I've always called the power to get wealth. You want to be a blessing in your finances. You want to be able to help when God's people are in need. You want to be eager to practice hospitality or warm generosity. I found this scripture in my old hippie Bible. How many of you were hippies with me back in the 1970s and you had the old army green living Bible? It only had one color, one style, and we all had them. Here's what it says, Isaiah 1, 19 and 20. Here's what God said, if you will only let me, if you will only obey, 
then I will make you rich. But if you keep on turning your backs and refusing to listen to me, you'll be killed by your enemies. He said, I, the Lord, have spoken. You'll be killed by debts, killed by bills, always owing or never owning. When I was a young Christian in my 20s, I had never heard a sermon about tithing. And after I became a pastor, I understood it's hard for a pastor to talk about tithing. I would put $20 in the offering and think, I'm probably giving more than other people are. Every week I'd put $20 in. I'm probably giving more than other people. Now at that time I worked at the Board of Water and Light. I had a fairly decent income. Now I got a hold of a book by C.M. Ward. Revival time book. And it was called Tithing. How did I get that book? I don't know. But I read it. And when I read it, my life was turned right side up. I found out that I wasn't tithing. I was only giving a portion of my income, but I wasn't tithing. I was not giving 10%. I thought, sure, $20, the church should give me a plaque. <laughs> and I made the commitment right then and there when I found out what tithing was, I said, I will always tithe the rest of my life. I will give God first because that is the First key, I've always taught this to people, that is the first switch that must be activated if we are going to allow God to give us the means of being warmly generous, as it says in Romans 12, 13. I understand the pastor's dilemma in not wanting to preach. I never wanted to be a money preacher. In 1983, I did a series on stewardship, only I called it Genuine Prosperity, The Power to Get Wealth. Because people are more apt to buy a book that says Genuine Prosperity, The Power to Get Wealth, than How to Be a Good Steward. <laughs> I preached six or eight weeks on stewardship and I put it in this book all about tithes and offerings and new covenant blessings. I put it all in this book so I would never have to preach it again. A pastor ordered a copy of this book for everybody in his church. We sold this book by the box fulls. Boxes full. Anyway, he called me and he said, Pastor Dave, I gave everybody in my church that book, Genuine Prosperity. He said the church income doubled within two weeks. Only the pastor should be shouting and uh, rejoicing over something like that. But really the people were rejoicing and shouting over it because they found the blessing of tithing, which is the first switch. Now, the reason I'm talking about tithing today is because it is all part of breaking a financial curse and bringing finances to our lives so we can be warmly generous. When Pastor Kev has a, a project, a ministry that God put on his heart, don't you want to be the first one to say, here, This is the most generous church I've ever known. When we were building the Global Prayer Center, we owed $89,000. It was going to be dedicated the next week, and I wanted to dedicate it debt-free. And it was a Sunday night. I told people, I said, I was really hoping to dedicate that um, Global Prayer Center debt-free. I mean, it was pretty expensive to build because we had all kinds of artwork, and a lot, a lot went into it. And we were $89,000 short, and some lady walked up to the altar and she 
put down a check. Somebody else walked up, put down some cash. Somebody, One by one, people in the church, I didn't ask them to. That's the kind of people we have in this church. Put the money down, money down. There was a pile of money up here. And when we counted it out, listen, that was Sunday night. When we counted it out, it was $93,000. We were able to dedicate the Global Prayer Center debt-free to the glory of God. Now see, you got to be able to understand how to be blessed in order to be warmly generous like that. Well, the book of Malachi is probably the most quoted biblical passage about tithing, but there's some amazing promises in it. And for those of you that say, well, that's in the Old Testament, I want to remind you that twice in the Gospels, Jesus endorsed tithing, but he said, don't overlook the other things like justice and mercy as well. And I also want to remind you that St. Paul said these were examples for us so that we don't make the same mistakes they did. Okay? Not only that, well, I guess that's enough. No, I'll tell you one more thing. If you're going to throw out all the Old Testament prom promises because they're in the Old Testament, you're going to have to throw out Psalm 91, your promise of protection. You're going to have to throw out Psalm 23, where the Lord is your shepherd. You're going to have to throw out the book of Proverbs. Throw out all the prophets. As a matter of fact, since Jesus, when he came the first time, was ministering under the old covenant until the resurrection of Christ, it was still the old covenant, then everything Jesus said, you got to throw out until after the resurrection. It is insane to say the Old Testament promises are not in effect. I'm in the New Testament. Why? Because all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And that is said in the New Testament. But here's what it says. I learned that the tithe is the first key to partnering with God for my finances and my future. And again, I know I'm singing to the choir, but you're going to meet somebody this week that says, I don't believe in that tithing stuff. And you're going to have some ammunition to talk to them. I know it's none of you. <laughs> Here's what it says. Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? That's just the way you say it, too. <laughs> and God answers, in tithes and offerings you have withheld. In other words, it's possible to steal from God. It's possible to rob from God. Whoa, not a good idea. Some people have God's clothes hanging in their closet. Some people have God's cars sitting in their driveways. But there's a consequence. And here he tells it. You are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, this whole nation. Robbing God? The consequence? Cursed with a curse? And that's obviously over your finances and your productivity. Because your productivity is the vehicle for your wealth building. And under this curse, the ability to accumulate sustainable wealth is shut off. And then God gives a solution to breaking the financial curse, and he says this. Bring all the tithes, all the tithes, not 7%, not 8%, all the tithes, the tenth, into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. This is the only place in the whole Bible God says, I want you to test me on this. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you so great a blessing until there's no more room to receive it. 
Verse 11. Amazing promises. I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. Your vine in the field shall not fall to bear, fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, your productivity, which brings value, which attracts wealth, will not be hindered. If you just break this curse, and it's not an act of the law, it's a act of faith when in faith you say God I'm going to do it I'm going to give 10% to you and you're really not giving it you're returning it because he gives you 10% more than you should have then all nations will call you blessed you'll be a land of delight says the Lord of hosts now, what does the tithe mean? It's a three-pronged word. If you look it up and go through the Bible, find this to be true. It means a tenth. Tithe is a tenth. A tenth of $100 is $10. A tenth of $1,000 is $100. A tenth of $10,000 is $1,000. It is a tenth. Who does the tithe belong to? Leviticus 27.30. The tithe is the Lord's and must be set apart as holy. It is the Lord's. That's how God could say, you're robbing me if you withhold the tithe. Secondly, it's a test. Because this is the only place we're told we can test God. And it says in verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 23 of, the, of Deuteronomy, the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. Thirdly, it is something set apart for God but marked for destruction if it's withheld. Leviticus 27, 30 to 32, and Joshua 7, verse 12. God has always... See, does God need a tithe? Of course not. But he needs to get us into a position to where financial curses are broken and the windows of heaven open and the right people, the right mentors come into our lives at the right time. The right teaching comes into our lives at the right time. Money is not going to probably fall out of the windows of heaven, but ideas and productivity and value ideas will come out of those windows of heaven. And when we act on them, as the old preacher says, money cometh. <laughs> I've found this to be true. Mary Jo and I, we committed to, when we got married, and we understood about tithing. We said we are always going to tithe twice, 20%. And it's kind of crazy. There are many times we faced the test. Because we didn't, when I worked at the power company, I, I got paid pretty well. But when I went in the ministry, that was another story. People say, never go into the ministry for the glory or the gold. I guarantee you'll never get the gold or the glory if, when you go into the ministry. Now, you'll get some respect and you'll get some, you'll get some of the other stuff too. It's sometimes challenging. That's why I told Pastor Snook, you want the church back again? Please, after 20 years of being pastor, please come back and take this flock. But seriously, pastoring is a great joy, but there's no greater joy than walking hand in hand with Jesus. There's no greater joy than seeing the promises fulfilled in our lives. But God always keeps something apart for himself. For example, you go back to the Garden of Eden. He said, it's all yours, Adam and Eve. It's all yours. All this luxury is yours. But that tree over there, I'm reserving for me. The day you eat of that is the day you die. They were tested. And God always gives us a test. And what did they do? They took of what was set apart for God. And that's how we got into this mess with war and disease and sickness and, and all the things that the devil does 
in this world. It came as a result of touching and eating what belonged to God. You read about it in Joshua. When God said, when you take over Jericho, all the silver and all the gold has got to be set apart for me. But that's not fair, thought one man named Achan. And he took some of the silver. And God knew it. They went to Ai and couldn't, it was a small town compared to Jericho, and they couldn't beat. They said, why? And the Lord said, because there is that which is marked for destruction among you. The tithe. That which God set apart for himself is marked for destruction if we take it. Achan took what was set apart for God, and Achan's and his entire family lost their lives within one day because it was set apart for God. So it's a tenth, it's a test, and it's marked for destruction if we withhold it. Now, Dick Mills prophesied over Mary Jo and me back in 1997, right out here in the parking lot. We'd gone out to dinner. Dick had ministered on Sunday, and I can't remember if it was a Sunday or Monday, but I remember we were back in the parking lot, and I wanted to get back into the building, and he said, wait a minute, I got a word for you from the Lord. And <clears throat> we sat out there, and Betty, she always had a pad of paper. She's writing down what her husband said, and Dick said, there is a a wealth anointing going to hit you. You're going to be a financial deliverer to many. And, uh, and everyone that receives what you say to them, it, it will move up into a higher degree of wealth. And he said a few things. And I just kind of, I kind of just took it with, with sort of a grain of salt. Betty gave me the word. I put it in there. The next day, Cheryl Salem called me. Now, she used to call Mary Jo, but she's never called me. But this time she called me, hi, Dave. <laughs> she said, I had a vision. I had a dream and a vision about you. I have to tell you. And she, she said, I saw oil being poured all over your head, dri just dripping right down to the hem. And God showed me that there is a fresh anointing on you. And you don't mind me talking like Miss America. Uh, he said, God showed me there's a, a fresh anointing coming on you, and everyone that will receive it will partake in that anointing. And I said, well, Cheryl, that's interesting, because here's what Dick Mills said to me the other last night, or whatever, I think it was last night. And I, I read that to her, and she said, that's it, that's it, exactly it. There is a financial anointing to be a financial deliverer coming on you. Okay, thanks, Cheryl. Click. Now, I never wanted to be a money preacher. I never wanted to preach on tithing. I never wanted to preach about money. What happened exactly two years from the time Dick gave me that prophecy, I sat down at my computer, and I began to write that book, The Road to Radical Riches. When that book was released, we released it. I see Mike Persons back there. We released it at Barnes & Noble and, and had a sale, and... The general manager sitting in this room today said that that book brought in one-third of the Barnes & Noble income that day. Not only that, it went like wildfire. We made $300,000 on that book for Strategic Global Mission, our ministry, to give scholarships to young ministers and grants to inner city children's ministries. $300,000 from the sale of that book. And I've gotten letters from all over the world. All over the world of what that book has meant in people's lives. Now, 2007, Mary Jo and I are at the Ritz-Carlton. Now, I believe you need to stay at the Ritz-Carlton just for a couple of nights 
to lift your vision. <laughs> Don't stay at Harry's Inn <laughs> because it's cheaper. We were at the Ritz-Carlton. We had a room, and, and, and our son and daughter, they were not married then, so they had a room across in another part of the hotel. And somebody said, we want to take you and meet some people. We'll have a vehicle pick you up in front of the hotel. And so Mary Jo and I thought, well, okay, you know, so the kids and I stood out there, a limousine pulls up. That's our vehicle. Mary Jo and I got in. David and Trina got in. We're looking all around. You know, wow. And the car took off, went down the coast of Florida and pulled into this gate. And here was this mansion on the Atlantic Ocean. And Mary Jo and I and Trina Lee and David, we walked up to the to the door and it opened and there was this famous lady saying hi, introduced herself and welcomed us in the home of, of hers and her husband's. People I had heard about for years, known, I mean known in a distance. And when we got in there, there's all these millionaires in the room. I mean doctors, real estate people, I mean, I felt out of place. I really did. I felt out of place. I didn't know what to say or what to do. These guys are running around with watermelon and, and tea and uh, water and all. You know, oh, thank you. <laughs> what are we doing here? What we were doing there is God was preparing me for what he was going to call me to do. And I don't believe it ever would have happened if Mary Jo and I had not been tithing. God opens the windows of heaven. Well, anyway, um, David and I flew back. Mary Jo and Trina drove back to, to Michigan. They wanted to drive. I can't remember why. But uh, so David and I flew back and I keep thinking about this experience. It was wonderful. The nicest people you'd ever want to meet in the world, all of them multimillionaires and millionaires. I thought they'd be the most stuck-up people. They were the sweetest people, Christian people, spirit-filled people. And I have all this rolling around in my mind. God, why did you give us that experience? Well, I got in my boat and drove out to Prayer Island. We, we have a little island on our lake, and I call it Prayer Island because that's where in the warm months I like to go park my boat, drop the anchor, and just listen to the Lord. And I take nothing but my Bible and a pad of paper and a loaf of bread. And this day I'm by myself out there and the Lord walks up to the side of my boat. I mean, I didn't see him, but I heard him. And he said, David, will you help me raise up 52 new millionaires in the church? First, I laughed. And then again, the same words, David, will you help me raise up 52 new millionaires in the church? And I said, that won't go over in my denomination. He never changed his mind. He said, David, will you help me raise up 52 new millionaires in the church? And after, you know, having a Moses burning bush experience and telling God, I don't want to be one of those money preachers or sell holy water from the tap, or scarlet threads for your generous, generous donation. I said, I don't know how. And he said, throw a piece of bread over. Mary Jo is sitting here. She'll tell you this is the 
honest to God truth. We were on that lake for eight years and never saw a seagull, not one. Never. Never. I threw that piece of bread over and seagulls all over the place, just scattered down to get that bread. And I thought, oh my goodness. Number one, I've never seen seagulls on this lake. Number two, I'll bet there were 52 of them. And I got scared. It was the Lord showing me, if you obey me, I'll show you how. It goes back to that Isaiah 1, 18, if you obey me, I'll show you how to be rich. Brother Dave, you shouldn't be talking about this in church. Yeah, well, you sh shouldn't be listening. <laughs> See, I just, I just can't stand it when a preacher talks about money or tithing. Some people say, all that church wants is your money. Why don't you say all Kroger wants is your money? Why is it always the church? <laughs> All that screaming eagle casino wants is your money. Never heard that. Never heard that. <laughs> so I committed to the Lord I would do it, but I don't know how. He said, I'll show you. I ran the boat back to the dock real fast and tied it up, covered it up, and buzzed home because I, I just, it was too much. I told Mary Jo, and she said, would you take me down to that spot? <laughs> Back down we go, <clears throat> buzzed her out there, shut the motor off, anchored, said, this is it. She said, it feels like such a holy spot. I said, well, this is where I pray. She said, give me a piece of bread. She threw it out the front of the boat, nothing, no birds. Give me another piece of bread. I gave her another one. She threw it out the other side of the, the, the port side of the boat. Nothing. Give me another one. I gave her one. She threw it out the starboard side. Now there's three pieces of bread floating and no birds. So I said, all right, Lord, if this was really you, I took a piece of bread, threw it out the back of the boat. <laughs> birds everywhere. Now I could count them. 12, 13, 11, and 14, because they were on four sides of the boat. There were 50 birds, and then Mary Jo and I looked over, and there were two big swans sitting right next to the boat, exactly 52 birds. And I said, God, I'll do it if you show me how. I didn't know how. The, the problem with most of us is God tells us what, but we can't figure out how, so we don't commit to what. I committed to what? And then John and Judy agreed to help. Mark and Jeanette. Mark's got, th these millionaires here got a great testimony. Ray Tadgerson, CEO. John Hayes, his business went from zero to 100 million in 10 years. I said, I'm getting all these spirit filled, these Christian mentors together to help and we started what was called Club 52 and in and 2009 we, that's how long it took from 2007 to 2009 to get it all organized and, and in six years the people from the 2009 class six six years nine millionaires and many of them had negative net assets and they came and I always taught them tithing is the first switch uh, Mark and Jeanette, you gave your testimony on film. You know, what, $485,000 in the red, and boom, with just within a short time, over a million in net assets. It all begins with the tithe. How can we be warmly generous if we're not blessed financially? Listen to Robert Morris. Be blessed financially. It begins with the tithe. Now, you know that. And I know that. Tithing is the first switch. Here's what it does for us. Number one, when we tithe, the curse of lack and poverty is broken. Number two, it gives us the blessing of protection. 
God said he himself will rebuke the devourer for our sake. Devourer is a destroyer, an exhauster, a ravager, one who wipes out things in your life. I remember a guy crying in my arms. He's a, a real nice guy. I like the guy. But he was crying in my arms. He said, Pastor Dave, you said something I didn't like. And he said, and I quit tithing because I was mad at you. And he said, a month went by, I lost my job. And I, in order to live, I had to live off my credit card before they canceled my credit card because they found out I didn't have any job. And he said, I got $41,000 of debt on my credit card. I said, yeah, take 30 years to pay it off, and it's going to be $300,000. He said, I should have listened to you. I should have listened to you. And this isn't ever meant to scare anybody because tithing is about faith, not fear. And do you know, you think this is just money prosperity preachers? I looked up in Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology that talked about the blessing of tithing and it said, first... The blessing gives us a favored status with God. In other words, God loves us all the same, but you probably noticed this, he favors us differently. Tithing brings the blessing of a favored status. Secondly, it endows us with the power for prosperity and success. And that's from Baker's. You want to please Jesus and be faithful to his call and be warmly generous? The starting point is always the tithe. And after time and after a test, you will now have all the resources to be a blessing and be warmly generous to others. Now here's the facts. You're not going to ask, and it, again, it isn't you. It's the other people. How much do I have to give? How much do they expect me to give? No, people with the grace of Jesus work in their lives, they don't ask questions like that. They say, how can I find resources so that I can be warmly generous or hospitable as it is in the King James? Here's some facts and promises, and I'm going to go real quickly. When we tithe, it shows that we're looking to God as our source, and that's an act of faith. I'm not looking to my employer. I'm not looking to Social Security. God is my source. Mary Jo and I make only a little income now. But our goal has always been, I mean, we have money in the vault. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but we get a, a very small income. And our goal was always to give 95% of our income and live on 5%. When, when I was pastor here, we were giving a little over 30%. Now, I, I check, and even, even though we have a small, small pay income, I found out, I came home and told Mary Jo, I just did the Quicken report, we have given 65% of our budget goes to church, charity, missions, and district. 65%. So I, we got 30% yet to go before we reach our 95% goal. I want to be the most generous person that ever lived in Michigan. My first, first six weeks of full-time work, they paid me $25, and the treasurer said, I don't know why we have to pay you. But Mary Jo and I thank God for a godly wife. She said, Dave, if we have to live in a cardboard box over at the park to pastor that church, we're going to get a cardboard box and we'll live in the box and pastor the church. <laughs> and we never did get down to, we were down to some crackers and, and milk, just a little bit of milk one time. We had a little baby girl and I started to complain. I said, God, where is, 
This is the test. We were tithing 20%. Are you going to keep that up? I tithe the 20% and then I griped to God, why don't we have any food? How am I going to feed my daughter? Mary Jo said, you're not going to complain. We're going to go out in this kitchen. We're going to thank God for what we got. And it's right. It's from an old sermon of mine on the miracle of Thanksgiving. <laughs> and so we started praising the Lord and jumping around. And we never, we never told anybody when we were broke. Never, never. We didn't come to the church and say, would you all pray for Mary Jo and me? We need $167.18 by tonight. We never did that because God is our source. We're tithers, therefore God is our source. Well, we jumped around, praised for 20 minutes, a half hour or so, and a knock comes to the door. And who could that be? I opened the door, and there's Mrs. Hoisington. She said, oh, Brother Williams, oh, oh Pastor Dave, oh, bro I, I know you don't need this. She said, but... While I was out grocery shopping, I had just read this book on how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And I, I thought the Holy Spirit was telling me to buy you guys two bags of groceries. I know you don't need it, but please I said, you must obey the Holy Spirit, sis. You must obey the Holy Spirit. My goodness, we opened that. There were steaks, and uh, we had the best. We never again, once we passed that test, we never again got down to crackers and milk. Never again. We can eat anything we want now. <laughs> Pastor Kevin calls for 21 days of fasting and I've got to buy a new wardrobe. <laughs> God gave me the right mentors. The right things at the right time came out of the windows of heaven. When we tithe, we're honoring God rather than robbing God. When we tithe, it proves that we're stewards of God's blessing and we can be entrusted with more. When we tithe, there will be food in God's house. That's what the scriptures say. So whenever somebody says, I'm not being fed here anymore, you know they're not tithers. When we tithe, we're testing God, the only place we're allowed to test him. When we tithe, the curse of lack and poverty is shut down. And you know what poverty really is? It's not having what you need to do God's will and to be warmly generous when others have a need. Fred and Arlene Kortrick, you know, they're both in heaven now, but Fred worked at, where did he work? Diamond Rio or Motor Wheel, one of those. After, I don't know, 15, 16 years, the place closed down. He lost his retirement, lost everything. But he said, we're not going to quit tithing. And I remember uh, when Fred walked up to me and he said, you know, our, Arlene and I have always tithed. And he said, our washer, washer and dryer is 35 years old. It's still going. He said, our carpet's 35 years old and you can't even see a worn out spot on it. God makes everything less. He said, we'll never quit tithing. In fact, I offered a challenge to this church one, one Sunday when I was pastor. I said, I need two families to volunteer to quit tithing for a year and then come back and report how everything's gone for you. <laughs> Do you know, not, not one person volunteered for that. And when we tithe, we receive the blessing of protection, which is a blessing only for, for, uh, for tithers. And I, I can give you story after story of people that were protected while hurricane, the tithers, the house, the only one that stood, like a line in the sand run, no. Alexander Cares Glass Company, wood, San Francisco fire, wood, Everything in San Francisco is burned down except for the care, the tithers factory. And he started putting gospel tracts in his mason jars from that day forward. Everybody that bought a box of those mason jars got tracts about the Lord Jesus. Because he believed God and he stood on the promise, the devourer, the waster, the destroyer, the one who wipes you out. 
is rebuked. I don't have to go, I rebuke you, devil, in the name of Jesus. You know, and go through all the gymnastics. God says, I'll do it for you. So you, you can tell your friend that doesn't tithe that tithing won't get a person into heaven. Only trusting what Jesus did on the cross at Calvary will get us into heaven. But tithing will bring us untold favor. Favor like you've never known. And by the way, just a couple weeks ago, we had the 21st Club 52 member report in going over a million dollars. We have now made 21 millionaires through Club 52. Thank you, Jesus. And I always tell them the first switch, it's got to start there with the tithe because the tithe is the Lord's. God wants your life. He doesn't just want your money. He wants you. He wants you to care about those people that Jeff tells us about. Jeff Bassett, you are an amazing missions director, and I just love your heart, brother. When I hear Jeff talk, he doesn't even, he doesn't even ask for money. I just can't wait to give to missions because of his heart for souls. Well, God's heart is for your soul. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord today, you can come to him. You can call out Jesus, forgive my sins, cleanse me of all unrighteousness. And just as Pastor Peter talked about, he'll cleanse you of all unrighteousness. It's true. He will. And listen, if you've been slack in tithing, I don't give this message because the church needs money. This church has God as its source. This church is debt free. That means that none of your money is going to pay interest. So I'm not giving this message because there's a need or some great hurt. You know what? I want to invest in this church. I want to invest in this church. And you do too. And those people you're going to talk to about this do too. But if by chance there's one person here that's not tithing, and I doubt there's any more. <laughs> if you commit to tithing, once you get through the test, you will never stop, I promise. Put God to the test. Break the financial curse. And let's be warmly generous. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Father, I thank you so much for the time you've given us together. I thank you for Pastor Kevin, Renee, their family, staff and board and their families. I thank you for the many friends and family in this, in this church today. Lord, I pray that You will bring alive in us warm generosity. People will see the generousness of your people. And they'll say, I have to be like that. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me for a moment? I don't... I've got one minute and 30 seconds left. No, one minute and 25 seconds left. Ministers and elders, and would you come up to the altar? I'm not going to give a regular invitation today, and I'm not going to call you up if you'll promise to start tithing. But listen, if you're not right with God today, you can make your peace with God. You can pray this. You can pray, Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead, and I want you to be my Lord and my Savior. 
If you've got anything that's hurting in your body or your mind, these ministers are here to help you. If you come to Christ today, I promise you something is going to happen. It's going to be the biggest miracle you've ever known in your life. But if you've got to get out, I understand that too. Pastor Kev, thank you from my heart for having me back here again. You're awesome, man. Jesus is awesome in you. And I'm going to pray a benediction. And then uh, those of you that would like to come up for ministry, come up. I pray the Lord bless you. The Lord protect you. I pray the Lord will do as he promised and give seed to the sower. Those of you who thought you have nothing, seed will appear from God himself that you can sow into God's kingdom to begin a new cycle in your life. I pray that if you've never tithed, that this will be your opportunity to make a solid commitment to face the test and receive the promises. I pray that God use you, God complete you in every way and perfect you. I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to you. I pray that Jesus will not only be your Lord and your Savior, but your constant loving companion to walk with you all the days of your life. I pray that you keep him enthroned as Lord. And I pray pray this is a blessing for you, my brother, my sister. I speak it because I believe it. And because I believe it, I decree it for your life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 God bless you all. Thank you.